Welcome, my name is Jesse Embry, and I'm the Associate Director of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, which is a research center here on campus studying the Inner Mountain West. Sometimes it crosses national boundaries. So we're delighted to be able to have you come to hear this lecture. Grisella and I chatted before this lecture and decided we prefer very short introductions. Uh, Griselle grew up in Mexico City. She went to university there and she got a master's in Montreal. She now goes to, my Spanish is very poor, so I'll just say it in English. She goes to the College of Mexico, which is a very prestigious college that does humanities and social sciences, has a lot more graduate students than it has undergraduates. Um, she's working there um, on a dissertation on Americans that went to, immigrated to Mexico. She won a Fulbright Prize, which is quite amazing since senior and students compete for those prizes. So it's quite impressive that she had a Fulbright. And when she looked for places to the United States to come do her Fulbright, she was most impressed with the response that she got from BYU. And since then, she has continued to feel very welcomed at the library and throughout. And uh, so we're delighted that she was willing to share the research that she's been doing. The Red Center has been uh, hosting her, and we're very grateful that she's been willing to share her research. So welcome, Grisel. Well, hello. Hi. Thank you very much, Jesse, for this presentation. And uh, before I start, I want to really Thank everyone at the Charles Ritt Center for Western Studies. Brian Cannon, Mary Nelson, and Jesse Embry have been really helpful, and I do, I have felt really very welcome in BYU during my, my stay, which is now close to an end. And, uh, well, after uh, giving this um, thanks, I'm, uh, I'm gonna start this talk. The, I, I want to share with you a little bit a part of, of what I've been researching here and studying, which is, uh, in very broad terms, as Jesse has already told you, American immigration to Mexico, late 19th century and the first part of uh, the first decades of the uh, 20th uh, century. And um, I think in that broad sense, uh, American immigration to Mexico has been a neglected, kind of a neglected topic for several reasons. Um, first of all, well, actually, American history and Amer America, uh, United States as a country have always been considered, obviously, a uh, mass immigration na nation. And as such, most of the research and studies on the topic has focused on immigration, not so much on emigrating groups towards other um, latitudes. And uh, complementary, Mexico has never been, even though uh, several governments and several policies try to uh, make Mexico a country of mass immigration, foreign immigration, never achieved that. So in that sense, uh, Mexican history is, is, regarding I immigration is, is not so much focused on em immigrating groups as the nationals that emigrate uh, to other latitudes. So basically, um, I think uh, this neglect um, has to be at some point, um, you know, uh, try to, to be uh, filled in with more research because um, even though American immigration to Mexico has not been, you know, massive or in quantity, you know, very, um, very significant, indeed has been quality-wise, I, in, I, in my uh, point of view, very important uh, ever since the, 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 the 19th century, and it's still today is it, very important. 76% of the foreigners that reside and choose to live in Mexico nowadays, according to the 2010 census, were born in the United States, are Americans. And uh, this population, uh, unequal and, uh, you know, asymmetrical as it is, uh, interchange of population between Mexico and the United States has to be complemented also with the presence of Americans in Mexico throughout history. 
So well, um, I got interested in, in, in the topic and um, well, it's a very broad topic, so now I'm just going to focus in a um, very particular case of uh, migratory movement, which is uh, basically group family and groups uh, uh, that immigrated to Mexico and settled together cohesive as colonies. Um, I'm going to touch several examples. Very, uh, I would say, different people and different cases, but I'm gonna try to, I, I've been finding certain particularities and characteristics that can be, uh, you know, um, seen as common in all of these cases that I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch. And, um, well, uh, before I do that, though, I think it is important for all of us to have a little bit of context uh, and, 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 and to see exactly what was, the, uh, what was going on in, in Mexico at the time, uh, let's say, around 1880s and, and um, the latter part of the 19th century, what was going on and uh, why uh, the, these groups were at some point attracted or found, found it attractive to leave their, their country and move and settle south of, of the border. So basically, um, what happened um, at, a, at the last part of the 19th century in Mexico is that for, um, uh, at last, let's say, a political regime uh, was able to bring some political and economic stability to a country that had been really very uh, convulsive and with a lot of uh, civil wars and wars with foreign countries and, uh, you know, not being able to uh, be stable, a lot of violence, not, not, not a political um, stability. So by the end of the um, 19th century, Porfirio Diaz and his regime was able to give some stability to the country. And what happened when, when he got to uh, this point and said, okay, so now we are stable and I would like to move uh, the nation towards modernity, towards you know, improving in terms of um, economic income, et cetera, et cetera, is that, okay, where are my weak points? What is going on? What kind of a country I have inherited? from all these convulsive years. And what he uh, found was that not much actually had changed since even before the uh, Spanish came in terms of particularly how the population was, the native population was distributed in the country. And to him, this was a very distressing point. Uh, let's see, well this is, a map of Mexico, just complete, just so that you remember. And this, is, this one is a very schematic one, but uh, basically it, it shows the green area, um, shows where the, the, the geographic, geographically where the, um, those big civilizations pre-conquest uh, pre were settled uh, throughout, uh, centuries and um, you know establish their cities commerce etc well when the Spaniards came um, basically that same uh, scheme was kept a lot of uh, most of the population uh, remained in that green area and all that yellow kind of a uh, um, huge area which basically is the north northern part of what now is Mexico, was sparsely populated with not, not a lot of very stable or, or developed uh, centers. And um, there was absolutely no, not a network that connected um, regions throughout the north or even the south, the most populated south, this is a, just a map of uh, what 
during the, the Spanish Empire, the only way or the only way connecting the country went from the capital up to Santa Fe and it was just one trail, that's it. If you can notice, there were no horizontal or transversal ways of connect, connecting um, these sparsely populated communities. And so this scheme persisted throughout the 19th century and when Diaz got there, he said, okay, so I got a sparsely populated uh, north, which uh, is, by the way, close to the United States and, you know, uh, as has happened before, could be, you know, uh, seized at some point because we don't have enough people there and we don't have communications at all uh, in the country. We don't have integrated markets. Or, and on top of all this, this political class led by, by Diaz was very much convinced in a very racist way that the native population was not, I mean, they, the indigenous population didn't have what it took to by themselves incorporate in a modern economy, a modern type of country that it was what it, what, what it was sought, you know, to incorporate, incorporate the country to capitalistic uh, markets and to bring the railroads and communicate the country. And they thought, well, indigenous people simply don't have that. They need someone else to learn from, have the example more modern groups, if you will. And so the answer to all of these um, problems um, to encourage progress of the country was in, in short to encourage and to bring and to attract foreign people who would go to Mexico, settle there, bring capital, bring their expertise, their know-how, their industrious, you know, characteristics that were basically thought to be innate in these people and to bring them and promote um, um, progress in the country. So basically that's the Mexican and the elite and the political way of um, interpreting Mexican problems and finding immigration of foreigners as a possible solution to some of these problems. Now, uh, I mean, that sounded clear to me and, and, and whatnot, but when I started thinking of why these people want to go, I mean, uh, to, to, to another country just like that, that's the question that really thought still, if Mexico wants to attract them, why are they choosing to, to follow through and to go and establish themselves in, in a different country? So. Um, I'm going to, to begin saying that, by saying that um, the notion of this northern and um, part that was sort of empty, sort of uh, at hand and available was also shared by some, some groups that saw in that region, that particular region, a very, uh, a promise of maybe putting into effect or achieving a kind of society that was not being able to achieve under the circumstances um, that um, the, the, the nation, as the United States as a nation imposed. And so we get to our first case, um, that the Polovampo colony, which is, uh, was, um, a colony um, formed or, uh, by a leader, Albert K. Owen, but also who, who had a lot of followers who believed in, um, who believed that the United States basically ran a system that was not giving them that was uh, what, what they were entitled to. They were laborers, people, and they were not getting what they were supposed to get. I'm going to, um, to read a, a quote from one of the colonists who, who expresses why 
did he uh, decide to to go to the Topolovan colony? I am fast becoming what I am indeed sometimes what I am indeed sometimes called the old man, and yet. Though I have lived a laborious and temperate life, I have not secured under our hell originated competitive system of distributing products what I claim as a fair share of good things of this life. I hope my grandchildren will be benefited by my exodus from the merciless bondage. So this guy, Stephen uh, Spencer, uh, decided to invest all what he had in the United States and had faith enough to move down to the Topolobampo colony with a lot of other people who thought the same in search of a more equal, more just way of, of living. The principles of this colony were that everyone, regardless their their labor, they were going to contribute with their profession, their, their, their craft, and they were going to be you know, get the same salary if you did a manual work, if you did um, you know, intellectual work, if you, as, as long as you contributed to the community, you were all were going to be in the same uh, status, always, uh, you know, trying to maintain some sort of equity among the, the members in contrast to what they have been experiencing uh, in their perception while they were uh, still back at the US. So basically what Owen saw in Mexico and that made him think that he would achieve, uh, th he could achieve this kind of community was um, sort of a space in between that the very fact that the, the north, northern part of Mexico was unpopulated and uh, more or less unpopulated and uh, unexploited as well, and far away from the center of power where uh, Diaz was back in the center of the country, and far away from the center of power from the United States. So that made him think he had a margin, a space where he can um, start and plan and build some sort of uh, new society uh, that will fulfill not only um, the members of, uh, of the community, their, their, their needs, but also uh, would contribute effectively to the development of Mexico as a country because the uh, project he had in mind was not only to be able to construct, build a, uh, a, a city and colonies that were out of uh, sufficient in, in themselves, but also um, connected, not isolated, but connected uh, to the uh, to the markets throughout the the railroad. He was planning not only on a colony, but also the colonists would build literally a railroad that would connect the colony with um, the you know, uh, other markets so that it could survive. I mean, it, it, he was not thinking about just isolating themselves and living in some sort of uh, ideal world. He was planning on building a port right there in the, uh, it was a, a bay, very near to, to a bay that was basically virgin. No one was, uh, was there. This was obviously very much attractive to uh, Diaz and his plans because basically there were no ports along the Pacific of importance that would you know, um, make commerce with uh, Asian markets possible. And he was thinking about um, that kind of capital capitalistic growth. So what Owen wanted to do, regardless uh, his utopian uh, society and regardless maybe that his utopian society was kind of denying or trying to, to, to deny the, the political governments of both the United States and Mexico, he was also trying to, to bring the kind of progress he needed in terms of constructing ports, in terms of building canals and uh, irrigational canals that will agriculturally make that particular part of the country that was 
basically abandoned, flourish in that sense, bring um, some sort of connection via the railroad to other um, parts of the country. So Diaz was absolutely uh, thrilled with this plan and absolutely gave uh, Owen all sorts of um, concessions and help in order for him to be able to bring people and to attract more colonists to, to Topolobampo. Actually, they uh, were doing quite well. Uh, however, being such an ambitious plan, uh, Owen needed a lot of financial backing, particularly for the project of, of building ports and building railroads. And um, so he, 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 he needed to get together with a lot of capitalists that actually said, look, you've got a really nice thing going on over there. People are getting along. However, um, we need more manual workers over there because you have a lot of intellectuals, a lot of artists. A lot of, it's very diverse, your community, and they're not helping. So we're going to have to attract some different type of immigrants that go there and help us build this, this railroad and this port. And, and so problems began when the cohesiveness of uh, the colony that was basically uh, brought together in terms of an ideal of, uh, of communal life of everyone, uh, you know, uh, eating the same thing, having the same houses, um, receiving the same salaries became disrupted by the arrival of different of immigrants who said, "Well, why am I getting the same salary if I'm working harder uh, than a teacher who just works a couple of hours?" I mean, and so problems began internally, and that is uh, what, in the end, uh, affected the life of of this colony and ended up disrupting it and making people either to return to the United States to search some other uh, uh, work in Mexico, but not as a part of a colony. And colony life just dismembered, and they weren't able to proceed as, as planned because of internal disruptions of, of this very ambitious plan um, of Albert Owen. But uh, indeed, the, um, the seeds of what they did uh, stayed and it was effectively uh, expressed or uh, in in the in the birth of a very important city that's now in the state of Sinaloa and uh, called Los Mochis and basically uh, Owen's legacy lived a little bit in in that sense um, and. Um, even though as a colony, the, 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 they were just over 10 years living together and working together, and then it just dismembered. But um, I brought some images, and I think it, it, it would be nice to compare them, I guess, later on with what we'll see, because the, uh, the geographical um, aspect is uh, the that they had to adapt to is going to be very much different in this coastal area that what Mormons found out and that other people that went to tropical jungle atmosphere found. So these are uh, colonists uh, in front of, uh, I guess, uh, it was a communal kitchen or something. And, uh, well, an important part of all of the colonies I'm going to speak about is obviously that they were very tight communities that uh, their ways of socializing, either entertaining themselves uh, or education or providing education, providing care from one, for one another um, was very tight and um, provided, it, it was uh, part of the success of um, of their life as a group, uh, when these new colonists arrived, they were they didn't care about 
this aspect of colony life, of uh, getting together after work and putting place and participating in who are going to be the leaders of the community. These new people, they didn't care about that because they didn't share the ideal, so that, that was a very important part of their failure as a colony, which obviously is something that uh, the Mormon colonies never suffered of. I mean, on the contrary, it was part of their very huge success. Um, more or less uh, in a very contemporary uh, way as the uh, other colony. Um, the the um, LDS groups began arriving to Chihuahua and, uh, set, uh, and, and settling in several um, colonies. And well, I mean, Mormon colonies in Mexico were f by far the most successful the, the jewels of, uh, of this colonization policy that Diaz was trying to very actively promote. Uh, and if Owen understood what Diaz wanted and uh, used it at his advantage, for sure um, Mormon, uh, the Mormon people got exactly uh, uh, what was the deal with, with Diaz, what he wanted from them, and, uh, in, in, and they received as well autonomy, uh, you know, a very, a very uh, protection even from local uh, authorities because they, they were able to very, very um, intelligently um, cater the, the, the needs and what Diaz wanted and show uh, how they were contributing to this progress by going to national fairs and showing what uh, the advances of their agricultural you know, endeavors and by showing um, physically how uh, irrigation techniques learned from before and, and putting into effect were actually making a very arid and, uh, part of the country you know, be productive in terms of agriculture. I mean, it was uh, very much of a give and take thing. And um, as such, Diaz was uh, able to provide them with um, a very important support, particularly because a um, um, very pragmatic man, Diaz, uh, wanted uh, prioritize, to prioritize the, uh, these economic goals and was absolutely, uh, uh, able to, without any shame, uh, bend whatever um, laws uh, would be in the way from that. And basically, uh, I, 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 I have this quote, while like all other good citizens, they observe the laws of the Republic and do not attempt any innovations, they will receive the treatment, the protection, and the consideration which their industrious habits and law-abiding conduct merit. So far, the Mormons in the state of Chihuahua have proved good immigrants. Innovations, obviously, I mean, was referred to a very subtle way to uh, basically religious practices. Obviously, the practice of uh, plural marriage, and which was uh, like the, the the catalyst of what. Uh, meant the, the first wave or the first drive of uh, people who got to Mexico and settled in Chihuahua uh, due to the very crude uh, anti-polygamist laws in the United States that w were basically threatening to divide families and were harassing people. And so uh, they... Uh, they knew and they understood that Diaz was, was going to be open to give them a space where these families could actually go there and keep living as long as they proved to be, you know, contributing in some other ways to what he wanted, to the progress of the country. And so um, they... Uh, they, they, that was like the first wave, but obviously reasons for migrating afterwards. And part of the success, actually, of these colonies 
it, in, in many other uh, as different as was happened with the Polo Bampo that was a little bit isolated. They were located right there in the border. They were very much connected, very easy train. Uh, the railroad was um, available very soon. Uh, it was easy to come and go. There were a lot of uh, different uh, communities already all the way in Arizona up to, the, to Utah. I mean, it was a network. Not only the, the colonies that were established in Chihuahua and Sonora were connected and were very much integrated to a, a Mexican local economy that was also thriving with the mines and provided seasonal job for, for the colonists as well when they were, uh, weren't were able to be farming. Um, they were able to get provisions easily from uh, the United States to sell stuff as well. So basically the, the, the location was key in, uh, in the... Um, uh, in the success of the of the colonies, and as a second uh, um, the second uh, uh, quote, quote says uh, states some other uh, some other reasons. Of course, I've already told about the good relationship with the state, the government, and uh, how they they were able to to have really good. Uh, relations with local authorities in the end. I mean, even though at first they were a little rocky, and of course with national uh, the the industry of the colonies, the the location, and of course the backing of the church was very much important for that for their success. In opposition to other colonies that invested all their things, and maybe they were gambling, and if they lost, uh, they, they couldn't make the payments for their lands. They couldn't. Uh, at some point uh, get the resources, well, they lost everything. In some cases, I mean, the, obviously, Mormon colonies were, were also, uh, could have these, these troubles, but the company, the colonization company that got the lands in the end was very much, uh, uh, in, uh, basically was totally connected with the uh, church authorities and being so tight as a, like as a family, well, if someone stood, uh, wasn't able to pay, maybe there were ways of trying to um, help them and give them time and give them, and so that they will, wouldn't lose their, uh, all their, their, their lands, their investments. So um, basically Mormon colonies had a lot of um, particularities that uh, added up to, to their success. And, um, and and well, as I've said, there were the the the, um, the jewels of uh, the S colonization uh, um, schemes. Well, just to compare a little bit the ge the the geography and the kind of uh, land where uh, where they were settled in comparison to others. Um, to others such as the people who went down to the tropics. Uh, northern part of Mexico was a huge uh, um, part of the, um, um, a huge region that was uh, hoping to get populated and worked and exploited, but also the, the coastlines were very much uh, neglected and, uh, and depopulated and in need of a lot of uh, exploitation according to, to the regime. And so the, not only the north, but the uh, coastlines uh, were also uh, trying to, to get people and were very attractive for several reasons. Uh, for example, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the colonists that decided to go to Metlalto Yuca, which is, let's say, around there, Puebla and Veracruz. It's a coastal region over there, you know, with a lot of potential for coffee and all sorts of tropical uh, agricultural um, agriculture. Uh, we're basically drawn by a lot of, um, of um, 
I don't know, uh, advantages that could be seen in comparison to the United States in, in first place. Um, let's see the, the, the climate, more, more benign. And uh, the, uh, precisely the, let's say, underdevelopment or of, um, of the region. In their minds, at some point, uh, very much alike, I guess, the, the socialist utopians that went to Tupalobampo thought that the urban industrial society of the United States were, um, was not, uh, had a lot of uh, drawbacks such as, I don't know, pollution and, and uh, you know, everyday life was just too, too fast and that sense of uh, being in a community uh, had been lost. And so um, I'm gonna read um, a quote from one of the ladies who joined the colony. And she said, here I find time to get on my horse in bifurcated garments, for how could I get off and on on a side saddle at the numerous gates and bars that are in my road? With my little boy in front of me, away we go through beautiful forest paths, the morning sun glinting on the dewy foliage and the invigorating air soothing the jangled nerves and making me wish all my sisters, cousins, and aunts were here with me. Well, this lady obviously uh, at some point uh, got tired or uh, got uh, really uh, weared by the uh, life of uh, urban uh, America. And in fact, the people that went to Metlaltoyuca colonies um, were people that had a, an urban background that came from the cities and that wished to go back and own their uh, land and, and do agricultural uh, farming work and um, get away from from the bad things that came along with modernity and industrialization. But at the same time, the fact that they were able to get together in a community that shared the same national background, the same language, the same uh, background, uh, urban background, permitted them not only to start, let's say, a new life uh, away from the bad things they were trying to run away, but also keeping uh, and keep practicing all those things, all those civilized things that were worthy, such as getting together for associations, clubs, organizing uh, library debate, uh, book debates and getting dressed, uh, taking off, I guess, the, the boots and, 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 the, and the pants and getting dressed, you know, and uh, talk about home economics, the ladies and the guys get together and try to uh, elect uh, people that were representatives of the community. It's uh, like, the, the life in, the, in a community that was uh, bonded by such a common background gave them the opportunity to keep all those uh, social ties and social practices that they brought from the United States. They, they thought they were worthy and uh, kept them. And at the same time, the idea was to uh, also get in touch with nature and with other um, other aspects of life that had been lost in the way of uh, modernization back home. So uh, that was the flexibility of, uh, of, the, uh, of living in, in, in such an environment. Well, this is the, uh, one of uh, a propaganda. Um, I think uh, uh, it's important at some point uh, I don't, I don't remember if it says that, uh, no, not here, but the idea of uh, bringing and attracting people to these parts of the tropics and the um, tropical uh, agriculture market, et cetera, um, really emphasized that this was not for people with a lot of capital. You, didn't, you don't have to be 
you, you have a lot of money to invest in this. This is suited for people who are home seekers, who, 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 who wants to, 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 to have their own piece of land and live easily and, 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 and not so much for uh, plantation owners and big plantations. Uh, this is just the, uh, the place they were um, going to, to, to they construct, the, they built their, their colony, which is radically different basically uh, from, from the other, um, other places we've, we've, we've seen. And very close to that place, also a tropical place, uh, another colony of, of Americans uh, was set a little later, um, at the, the start of the 20th century. Uh, very much uh, of the same nature, farmers uh, that wanted to, to develop agricultural um, products and, and, and sell them in the, in the markets that wanted exactly demanded those kind of products, coffee and uh, other products. Well, those guys, the Blalock colony, Blalock was uh, the leader of, uh, of this colony, came from, uh, were neighbors basically from, uh, from Oklahoma and they decided to go to Mexico basically because at some point they uh, perceived that the idea of becoming a homeowner, small farmer, at least where they were living, um, was, was not possible and was easier to achieve it uh, in Mexico with the, all the, the, the facilities. Um, this is a, a, an interrogation uh, with the uh, leader of the, of the colony. Uh, and basically what he states is that uh, they went to Mexico home seeking and down there uh, they, 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 they had the opportunity to become exactly what they sought in the opposition to what they had experienced before in, in the United States. Um, another, of, uh, another colony says, uh, how, how does that class of Americans who were your neighbors in the colony compare with American citizens in your own home of Durand, Oklahoma and other places in the United States? Horton, the William Horton, the, the, colonizer the, the colonist replies, well, I regarded the citizenship of that colony as over an average citizenship from the fact that they were all homeowners. There was not a renter in the colony all owned their lands and lived at home. That was the emphasis, and that was pretty much the ideal that drove these people down there, down to Mexico. And, um, and that was, the Blala colony was as well, a very uh, successful one. So I'm going to start to hurry up because I, I do have one more case that I think is very important to, um, well, at, this is uh, some images of the colonists uh, down there by the uh, bananas. Well, I mean, in order, um, in order to, to be successful and to be able to achieve uh, their, their goals of uh, settling in, in, in Mexico, you know, as I've stated before, a lot of the uh, of these people had to develop certain uh, strategies to adapt either to the environment or to the culture or to the neighbors or to the uh, authorities, the Mexican authorities, but also in a way uh, their relationship with their country was uh, at the same time reshaped and, uh, and, and, and tested. And uh, that part, the relationship with the United States being colonists in Mexico really rose up and, and started to, to, to get, uh, to be significant whenever trouble arose and whenever uh, it was not so sweet for these colonists and then they were maybe threatened or they wished to leave Mexico or they were forced to leave Mexico. And um, one example 
of what the group migration and being part of a colony could accomplish uh, if working together uh, when demanding something from the country of origin is this odd uh, example, I think, of the Tlahualilo colony, which was a, a colony planned and uh, promoted and thought to attract African Americans that would uh, settle in uh, part of Durango, which uh, is a good place to raise cotton and to cultivate cotton. So the idea was that uh, the thought of the Mexicans, were, well, uh, African Americans from the South uh, certainly most surely should have the expertise of uh, of, of this industry and uh, this particular agricultural uh, venture, so let's try to bring them here so that they can um, show us better ways to, to, to because uh, at for, that was uh, a production that was starting at that time. So um, b uh, basically they try to attract these people by uh, playing the equality, equal rights for everyone rights with, uh, in Mexico, which of course, uh, I mean, as I said, laws were, were very bendable and uh, uh, not that uh, um, strict in, 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 in the, during the Diaz regime. So basically maybe by the letter that was true, but, uh, but well, I mean, not at all. Uh, so when they went over there and uh, they were not very satisfied with the conditions they were working on and with the promises that they felt were not being, being uh, fulfilled by their employees and um, not, not, they weren't able to adapt and uh, the employers as, as well thought they were not giving exactly the, the, the kind of uh, contribution they expected because basically these people were miners and not agri uh, people who had been working in agriculture. Well, the misunderstanding uh, got to that point where the contract was broken. The, the, the African Americans just left the, the lands and tried to get back home, but they were absolutely broke with uh, nothing uh, except you know, to demand the authorities of the United States to bring them back home. Um, and so they went to consular agents and they wrote letters to their representatives back in Alabama where they were from. And they pushed and pushed and um, they were unwilling to leave their family, the males who were able to get jobs at mines or somewhere else to get money to try and get their families back home were absolutely unwilling to leave them. They stuck together, and uh, the basically Washington, what, told, what the consuls just wrote and wrote, please uh, give us some money to just take these men back to, these families back to Alabama, and Washington said, no, we can't do that because they left, they gambled, they, I mean, they left willingly their homes and, uh, well, they, they have to find a way. We can't help these people even though they're, they're American citizens. And in the end, uh, they pushed so hard that actually even uh, if they, uh, it wasn't in the, the, the position of the government, the government in the end did have to pay uh, railroads, uh, rail uh, road service for them and had to pay uh, food for them while they were waiting and had to take care of them because uh, they would uh, simply not leave the idea that it was their right as American citizens in a foreign soil that wanted to go back that the government should help them. And in the end, they, they got what they wanted. And, uh, okay, uh, I guess... I'm almost done. I wanted to end up with a, um, a case on the Mormon exodus, and um, so I'm gonna do it really quite fast, <laughs> which is another example of how the going back to a country during time of distress, completely different example, because this was a forced evacuation, basically, due to uh, threat of their lives. Um, 
was able to reshape in some sort uh, the relationship uh, of this particular group with uh, the United States government, the United States Army, and the people and connationals, particularly in Texas, and uh, how at, at some point the, uh, the response of the people who and the government and everyone who helped them when they were uh, coming back, going back, well, coming back, um, served uh, as some sort of uh, re uh, reconciliation in the terms that they were not being singled out because of their religion, but they were seen as Americans. Mexicans saw them as Americans primarily, and uh, as such, they received uh, the the the, the, the rejection from the revolutionaries um, that wanted uh, them out. And um, in that sense, the return migration, forced return migration, basically joined them to, uh, uh, to their national, nationals and to the idea of being an American and not only singled out as being a uh, Mormon, a uh, part of a, of a religion. So in that way, I, I, I find that these examples can give a lot of insight, not only of the motives of why they chose to leave or they didn't find in their country of origin some sort of, a, a, of sense, and when it also helps the movement coming and going, reshapes not only the uh, the relationship with other countries with other uh, with with foreigners but also with their own country of origin